Good evening, everyone. My name is Danielle Hodes, and I'm the Senior Program Manager and co-lead for the September 11th, 20th anniversary initiative at the Smithsonian's National Museum of American History. And I'm so proud to welcome you to Hidden Stories, Hidden Voices, Latinx Empowerment After the Attacks. After two decades, the nation continues to feel the lasting effects of the terrorist attacks of September 11th, 2001. As we mark the 20th anniversary of that day, we are launching a new initiative, September 11th, An Evolving Legacy. This effort seeks to create a more robust national collection of objects and stories, one that not only records and explores the day in the aftermath of September 11th, but also documents the continued and varied effects that September 11th has had on people's lives over the past 20 years. The initiative includes a story gathering web tool for the public to contribute their stories, a series of virtual panel discussions, and a website featuring new artifacts as well as artifacts and photos from the museum's collection. This is the final program in the series, Hidden Stories, Hidden Voices. This discussion will feature members of New York City's Latinx community sharing their experiences serving as first responders, volunteers, organizers, and caregivers. You can also find recordings of our first two programs, Portraits of Manhattan's Chinatown and Art in the Aftermath on our website, americanhistory.si.eu. I'd like to give a special thanks to tonight's participants, who you'll hear from in a little bit, as well as the program's moderator and my colleague, Dulcina Abreu. Dulcina is a Dominican-born independent curator, artist, and museum advocate currently based in Baltimore, Maryland. She graduated with an MFA in curatorial practice from the Maryland Institute College of Art, focused on digital platforms and community-based archiving. She holds a BFA in fine arts and media from Parsons, the new school. Prior to living in New York, Dulcina studied at the National School of Visual Arts and Altos de Chavron School of Design, both in the Dominican Republic. Abreu's work explores 21st century visual and material culture from the Caribbean diaspora in the US immigration, community-based collecting, and participatory mapping. She serves as a consulting curator for the September 11, 2001, An Evolving Legacy Project at the National Museum of American History, and is co-founder of the International Coalition of Museum Professionals and Communities, alongside Armando Perla. Abreu currently manages the New York City Latino 9-11 Collecting Initiative and New York City Latino COVID-19 project, which aims to expand the national narrative with Latino and Latina New Yorker stories and material culture. This panel is produced by the Smithsonian's National Museum of American History, with support by the Smithsonian Central AV Office. This program was developed in collaboration with our partners at the New York Committee for Occupational Safety and Health, the Mexican Cultural Institute in Washington, DC, and the Consulate General of Mexico in New York. Before we get started, we would like to acknowledge here in the greater Washington DC region, the proceedings of the Piscataway, Pamunkey and Nacostein tribes and their descendants. The Chesapeake Bay region is still home to many indigenous people from all over the hemisphere. Wherever we are, let us acknowledge and give our respect and gratitude to native peoples for the opportunity to work and live in their territories. I would also like to share a few housekeeping notes before getting started. Please use the chat to connect to your fellow audience members. And please note that today's conversation will be grounded in the code of conduct. More informational information is available in the chat. Live closed captions in English, Spanish, and simplified Chinese are available for the entirety of this program. On a final note, please be aware that some of the stories and information contained in today's program describing the events and aftermath of 9-11 could be triggering to some audience members. The acts of terrorism committed on 9-11 were horrific, and we will impose no limits or restrictions on the speaker's sharing of their experiences. Now it is my pleasure to introduce Liam Lynch from the New York Committee for Occupational Self Safety and Health to say a few words. Thank you so much for having us this evening. It is quite an honor and privilege. Um, my name is Liam Lynch. I'm a safety and health specialist with NICOSH. New York Committee for Occupational Safety and Health. We are a nonprofit in New York City working with unions and worker centers, worker organizations to fight for safer jobs. Uh, NICOSH was there uh, after 9-11 working with the community and labor uh, movement to fight for the rights of both responders and survivors, including the many, many Latinx workers involved in helping to rebuild 
uh, this city uh, and this country. Uh, they are the unsung heroes who sacrifice their health to help us all. Uh, the partnership tonight is crucial to continuing to highlight and remember the sacrifices made on that day 20 years ago and the many months of recovery. NICOSH helped advocate for the James the Droga Act, which established a health care program for this community for the many ailments they are suffering from their exposure, and also established a compensation fund to compensate for the numerous uh, physical illnesses related to exposure to that toxic dust. There are over 100 different illnesses related to exposure, including many cancers. 20 years later, this community is still suffering. So 20 years later, we are here to continue fighting to ensure that this community is getting the care and compensation they need and that the sacrifices of this brave community are remembered. So thank you for hosting this extremely important event. Thank you for working with NICOSH and thank you to all the responders and survivors who showed us the true definition of resilience and courage. Uh, now we begin our program. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Liam, for these words. I am extremely happy to be here. Uh, I am Dulcina Breu, uh, the curatorial consultant for um, September 11, 2001, and Evolving Legacy. And I'm very happy to see four uh, panelists that we are having three years working with in this particular collecting that I'm going to let you know now, that is the NYC Latino 9-11 project. Uh, in 2018, with funding from the Smithsonian Latino Center, the National Museum of American History launched the NYC Latino 9-11 Collecting Initiative to expand the narratives of the attacks, uh, to identify Latino, Latina stories, objects, and archival material, so to create content and visibility for the community. In 2001, around the 20% of the population of, of New York City, it was Latino. Uh, this tells a broader story of belonging and heart, showing both the everyday heroes who worked 12 hour shifts, as Manny is going to explain, during the rescue effort and the emotional and physical labor of educators and social workers who volunteer um, as Luzati and as Milagro. Um, as well Yolanda, uh, volunteered in time and resources amid the devastation, reminding us of the chaos, the bravery, the loss, and the unity felt that horrific day. Uh, I want to extend my gratitude to our, our partners from the Mexican Cultural Institute, in special to Exnic y Ruegas, to Beatriz uh, as well, and to uh, Miguel Gleason, that work with us from the Mexican Consulate General in New York City, all of them facilitated a lot of collectings that were not possible without their guidance and support um, as well. I want to introduce uh, other partners that were uh, working with us, not only on scholarship, but as well uh, identifying uh, moderators or identifying panelists for this particular programming. We have Andrea Delano, uh, Benjamin Yamas, we have um, Andrea Valencia that it was yesterday uh, with us as a moderator. And now we are going to pass the word and introduce our wonderful um, supporter and our wonderful friend, Manuel Castro. Manuel, uh, at five years old, uh, immigrated with his mother from his native Mexico. He grew up in New York City and was part of the early generation of undocumented youth activists known as Dreamers. Manuel and a Bachelor of Arts in Urban Anthropology from Hampshire College and a Master of Public Administration from the School of Public Affairs at Baruch College. City University of New York. Manuel work has been covered by the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, El Diario La Prensa, NPR, Univision, Telemundo, and others. Um, Manuel is the executive director of NICE, the New Immigrant Community Empowerment, uh, and is a nonprofit organization dedicated to improving the lives of immigrants workers in New York City. 
We're very delighted to be uh, working with Manny and with the team in New York City. Uh, during the COVID time, we were volunteering to understand better how to archive and how to document these critical moments in history and how to better serve our community and create proper representation for uh, Latinx X history. Uh, speaking a little bit about what NICE does, NICE operates worker centers in Queens, in Brooklyn and the Bronx with over 12,000 registered members and a variety of programs aim to strengthen uh, the individual and collective capacities of its participants. I want to pass it over to Manny and thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much, uh, Dulcina. I appreciate your, your introduction and all your work to make this event happen. Uh, and well, also I wanna thank the Smithsonian for putting this event together. Everyone really involved in this in this event and in all the uh, events commemorating and remembering uh, the 9-11 attacks from 20 years ago. And it's such an honor to be a panelist uh, with uh, everyone who you will hear from today and I'm just glad to be able to also share my story and that of my family and of my community. As Dulcina mentioned, I'm the Executive Director of New Immigrant Community Empowerment, an organization that was around uh, when 9-11 happened 20 years ago and of which I was a volunteer of in the years after. And so uh, my work uh, with the community goes back uh, into those early years, as Tulsina mentioned, I grew up in um, Brooklyn, New York uh, with my parents. I came here when I was young, uh, when I was a uh, five year old and I grew up undocumented. And when I was in high school, still undocumented, I was able, I witnessed uh, the 9-11 attacks um, with uh, the rest of the students from the windows of our school. This is a newspaper clipping uh, that describes the impact of um, of of the 9/11 attacks on on the school and the students. We were just across the East River. This is uh, an image that uh, reminds me of you know the those days that day and of how we saw the attacks take place uh, close by. This is a image of my high school yearbook, uh, a yearbook I, I recently pulled out uh, for this uh, for this clipping. Um, and it describes, uh, you know, what students were going through uh, and especially those students that were uh, afraid of what would happen to them and their families uh, after the attacks. I, as I said, I volunteered for New Immigrant Community Empowerment, the organization I was a uh, I am the current director of. This is an image of the website uh, from that day or from those uh, those uh, months after. Uh, and uh, it, nice at that time, I was a very small organization based in Queens, New York, and most of uh, what the organization focused on was responding to the attacks on immigrant communities after 9-11. Unfortunately, we saw a lot of violence against uh, communities, especially the Sikh and South Asian community. Here's an image of a rally that I helped organize. Uh, but I also want to uh, acknowledge and recognize another organization I volunteer for after 9-11 called Asociación Tepeyac de, Un de New York. I'm sure there will be mention uh, tonight uh, by other panelists. I was able to volunteer for the organization. This is a clipping of their website from that very day. Um, they quickly mobilized at the time. It was the largest, uh, probably really one of the few Mexican organizations in the city. And they were also located very close to Ground Zero. And along with their members and, and volunteers, uh, they quickly organized uh, 
to start speaking to the families of workers at Ground Zero. They set up the site, uh, which I was able to find in the archives, uh, where they listed um, uh, names of people who, um, who were disappeared or who had not communicated with their families. This is a flyer of one of the events they organized uh, soon after uh, at Union Square in Manhattan, where that I participated were families of uh, individuals that were missing, came together with supporters. And I remember vividly looking for the group of uh, immigrants, particular Mexican immigrants in Tepeyac that had gathered there with other relatives of 9-11 victims. Uh, they published eventually a list of everyone that uh, was identified missing. And here's a list, you can access it and you can uh, revisit the list to see who had been identified and, uh, and if anyone had come forward with more information. This is a pamphlet of uh, the program that the Asociación Tepeyac set up to um, help families of those who had died uh, and those who were still missing after 9-11. Here are some of the programs of which I also helped with. Um, you know, available to those families. And eventually here's a list uh, that I um, still have actually of people that uh, we had identified uh, had died at Ground Zero. It's a spreadsheet of people that I was able to help uh, maintain, call people, individuals, uh, to update information, their information and um, also um, provide additional resources over the years. And so it, it's, it's one of those uh, lists and one of those uh, experiences that you just never forget speaking with people who, you know, uh, who were still hopeful that their uh, family member might show up one day. Uh, and so that stayed with me. Um, this is a clipping of uh, an award that I received uh, about eight months after 9-11 for some of my work as a high school student. I received a small scholarship. This was from the Park Slope Civic Association, the neighborhood of which my high school was located. At this same event, uh, the members of Squad One, uh, firefighters in the community were also honored. Unfortunately, um, and this is a close up image of that photo. Unfortunately, uh, that squad of firefighters lost 12 members uh, and many of them died over the years due to the exposure at Ground Zero. And this is the door of a fire truck of that squad. Uh, that is now kept at the Smithsonian. And uh, just to bring it back uh, to the present, New American Community Empowerment is now a much larger organization, uh, but we continue to do a lot of the same work that the organization started to do in those early years with immigrant communities. Uh, over the last 18 months, we've helped uh, immigrants who were left out of any type of assistance. As Dulcina mentioned, during COVID at uh, the epicenter in Queens. Uh, this is a vigil that we held at Union Square. I remember the, the same vigil that I participated in after 9-11 and we decided to hold a candlelight vigil. We projected an image onto a side of the building with the names of those um, individuals that had died due to COVID and with some hopeful messages for, for the community. And finally, these are images from just today. Uh, the same communities, the same immigrant workers are still participating in supporting each other. This is from a, a help that we were providing our local community after Hurricane Ida. And uh, many of these workers uh, I'm representing here today because they also experienced 9-11 uh, firsthand. 
Uh, and unfortunately, they continue to be undocumented and excluded from support, but they're very much New Yorkers and they were very much part of 9-11 of and all those years after. So again, thank you so much for allowing me to share my story and it's such an honor to be part of this panel today. Thank you. So much, Manny, and I'm I'm very happy to see these images as well. Um, as many of you maybe that are in the U.S. Uh, know, New York City was hit very hard on uh, the last weeks with the flood, uh, and a lot of uh, community organizations have been responding, as uh, you saw from Nice. Uh, in this way, and now I am very uh, excited to introduce another person that have been working with the community uh, for so long, and uh, it's a, a Brooklyn uh, superstar, uh, and I want to introduce now Milagros Batista. Uh, she was originally from the, the north coast of Dominican Republic in Puerto Plata, and um, came over with her family on the, at the age of like seven, eight, uh, Milagros have been an active participant on, on in the social service profession since graduation from Brooklyn College in 1979. She was dedicated her professional career to provide services for children and families. From 1979 to 1983, she worked at the door a national model program for youth. From 19 to 83, she was working as a caseworker for the crisis intervention program in the New York City shelter for homeless families. She was a key member uh, to fund Alianza Dominicana, who was a nonprofit organization who was focused in the Dominican immigrant community in the Washington Heights area. She was like one of the person who started identify gaps in the services that the community was receiving and continue working with the community, not only in the side of social services, she as well as started to work in between uh, mental health and our healing processes that were developing um, systems to cope with mourning and to cope with the unexpected death of family members. And now I am very excited to introduce Milagros Batista. Uh, I would like to thank Lucina for coming to a dangerous community and finding that there are people like the four panelists that are in the in, here today talking to all of you about the work that is needed and how people like us dedicate our lives to work with passion, with love, and committed to the work we do. But before I talk about myself, I would really want to thank the uh, Lucene for taking time, for thinking and having the story of those voices that are now in front page of the main media, like we saw the, all this week, all those uh, that, yes, they, they died, but so many other died, but we don't see them in the front pages. And I really want to thank uh, the museum and all of you who are dedicating to find us and our voices to be heard. So uh, I want really to thank Lucina for finding us, for taking time out to find us. And here I am. Uh, this picture is me. I am one of eight children. I am the one on the left. I am with my uniform. It's a Friday afternoon coming out of the fifth grade. And I am a, ha a happy child with my two, si two siblings and a friend. And look at us. You can tell that this is a very poor community. I am from, my parents were born in a, the countryside, my mom. And from my mom, we didn't go to the capital city. We came straight to New York. Next picture. Uh, this picture here, uh, Manuel, I want you to see if you see who, where this is. This is junior high school 51. 
in Brooklyn, New York, Fifth Avenue. As you can see, uh, our dressing style. This is the group of my first immigrant friends. And here you see the young lady in the left is a Colombian, the only man, Equatorian, the young girl in the back with a peace sign, Puerto Rican. The next one to me, and I'm, the one uh, in the middle is Milagro, that's me. And then the next one is uh, Dominican. And then the one with the black and red, my best friend, we've been friends since then. That picture was taken in 1969. We're still very good friends. Next. Here, okay, again, my graduation, John Jay High School, Manuel. We are come from the same school. Um, as you see, uh, I came and I did my graduation on time, not knowing any English, but uh, having a background very uh, with my parents, really emphasizing the study is a must, education. So I graduated high, high school six months before my time. Next. And here again, Continue my education. Here is Milagro Genoveva Batista graduating Brooklyn College again on time. I am one of the, the second graduating group of Dominican in CUNY. I was lucky to be part of the open admission. I didn't have to pay to go to college. And after my college degree, my Brooklyn College degree, I, had a, I have a BA in uh, in, uh, in education and uh, I want to go to the next the next picture I want no let me go back to the next to the picture before this okay I want to emphasize that why is when we're talking about uh, empowering a community and the community organize themselves and we organize from the bottom up. I really want to let people know that you can do this through really educating yourself. And I think we were able to get to what we did and then go less through the education and getting involved, organizing. I did my master's degree uh, Hunter College School of Social Work, but my master was in in organizing, not in therapy, not in uh, only looking at the problems as an individual, but as a community. And there is a such thing that you can do study organizing method. And that's right. Then I want to come to the next picture, which I um, I wish that it was another one, but I, I can go with this. Okay, through my education, through my organizing style and seeing the needs and political involvement, I was able to put together or become part of a group of young professionals that saw the problem that the community were facing. And uh, there were people saying that they were addressing those needs, but we knew that they were not being addressed appropriately. So we did uh, come together and we was able to organize and develop the largest community service agency that is Alianza Dominicana. And through Alianza Dominicana, we were able to develop services that people were amazed to see how we were addressing the needs of the community that was really resolving problem. And this picture that you see right now, I was invited to, as Alianza Dominicana, to speak to the first lady who was putting together an initiative that every child should be, to have health, free health care. And they found that the community like ours, an agency like ours, were the strong advocacy. And we were clear that children no matter your you economic status, your legal status, or 
where you come from should have medical care. And this invitation was at the family reunion that uh, Vice President Al Gore and his wife had were, uh, all put together. And they found, uh, invited, uh, all, they went around the nation, they invited 15 organizations, and I was the one chosen to become, to come in front of the president at the time, Clinton and the first lady and a whole group of uh, people. And I said to them that yes, we believe in free medical care, free insurance, and that every child should have uh, on, until age six, uh, 18, from zero to 18, free medical care. And I was able to speak for half an hour and during that time uh, in front of 1,500 people and I had about three standing ovation. Next. Here uh, I am having the president signing uh, the, the, the policy that yes, children will, children between age zero to 15 to 18 will receive medical care. And it was a, a very, very emotional experience have been close to these powerful people. Next. Uh, here I am, and I must tell you that I am the wife of Moise Pere, who was the founder and executive director of Alianza Dominicana. And we are here we are with uh, Tipo Goa, who is, uh, was the, this is at the, uh, their home, the Marine House, and we were invited again as one of the representatives of a community and people who were doing the right work. Next. Okay. Uh, why was I talking about education and being close to people uh, who have power, people who knew what we were doing? And I want to tell you, that what we did during 9-11 was the work that we were doing already for about 15 years that Alianza was creating an innovative program. Right here, you see the work that the, uh, our, uh, the Corazón a Corazón camp, and this camp was created especially just to deal with the children affected by 9-11. And the kind of uh, camps that we did the first summer was very therapeutic, but also artistic. The name of the, of the day come was De Corazón a Corazón. And this name was created by the, by the young people. And they were the one who designed and tell us, tell us like the pro, many other programs or our practices was tell us what you want, tell us what you need and how we can help you. And here, if I can show closer the picture, what the children, and this, the, the, the day camp was for children between the ages of five to 13. And this is the work that they did during the camp. This is part of the artwork. And if you see, many of them drew the, word, the, the towers, the, the two towers. And one of them, you see bird flying. And this is the work that we did for children and the work we did for the, the parents. And can tell you uh, that we did from escorting to finding where they were to helping them the resources that they needed during the time but i think the most pressure thing that i feel we did was working with the children and for me working with the children and today contacting to find out where are those children as now young adult is the story that i really would like to be told from now on to 2025. Uh, the next, uh, here we are, community healing. Uh, as you can see, this is a couple of days after the 
with the community healing. This is just one of our community virtual. The picture that I'm holding here, this is myself, and this is the clothing that I have been collecting for the museum, which I can now explain my emotion when I see this in the, in the page. But I am holding right here with a group of mothers that are on the, on the left side, a picture of a mother who lost her son. This is uh, a firefighter who died in the, in the tragedy. And right here, and we're not, uh, we're not showing those pictures because these are, this is the, the people who are part of the Virgil. As you see the, fire, the firefighter, we went in front of the, of the community um, firehouse where nine firefighters died. But across the street from them, a child, a young man from the same street died in the in the tragedy, and it was a combination of being doing a ceremony with a firefighter and the community resident. Next. Here is the picture of not only you are supporting the family through concrete services, but also um, spiritual. We come from a community, from a culture that we do uh, mourn, we do uh, Ora Santa. Uh, the agency, since we didn't have the place or the body to have people uh, bur not buried, but um, hacer velaciones, uh, we create a space at Alianza, at the open space, where each family will have uh, a place where they can come and pray and do the ritual that we would have done back home and that we will still do here when we have a loved one pass. Next. Uh, again, we not only do the concrete services, we express it throughout the community. This is Alianza sharing with the entire community that yes, the 9-11, the um, World Trade Center, estamos en luto. But also, we uh, two months after the 11, the 9/11, we had the Fly 87 and that duplicate or triplicate the number of families that were suffering the death of the loved one. So here you see pictures and points and the entire community accompanying the family that lost a loved one through the World Trade Center in Flight 87. And we participate in parade with 500 people marching around the family. And this is the work that community-based agency had done, not only directly to the individual, but, but with the entire community. Next. Okay, okay. One thing that I wanted to say about this group, in order for us to do the magnitude of work that we did with the family, we began the work working with private money. We did have the volunteering, the staff volunteered for the to do this work, to respond to hundreds and hundreds of people, but we also work closely with private funding. And this is the Casey Foundation, who a couple of months after 9-11 uh, uh, and Fly 87, invited us to come to their headquarters in Baltimore. And this was to spend a whole weekend with a group of family affected by 9-11 and Fly 87. And right here, I want to show you uh, all the, the kids but see this woman with a newborn baby. Uh, this is the spring of two, early spring. 
this is a mom that lost her husband during 9-11. She was pregnant and had that she's carrying a baby that never met the father. And all of those children lost either the mother or the father. This the man uh, has to this two this kid and this little one. And it's a, a father who lost his wife. And this are uh, again this young man here, he is an officer at the Casey Foundation who really, really was impacted by the story that all these women and men was telling about how they were affected by 9-11 tragedy. Next. Uh, okay, the other part here with this um, poster, here we are in a community that is being provided services by many, many institutions. Uh, we do provide services that are quality and that are professional because we do do partnership with other institutions. And at this time, we had a, a partnership with Columbia uh, Medical Center, Columbia Presbyterian Medical Center, but also with Columbia uh, Medical School. And not only were the, the medical center providing health care for all of those children, but also they were providing training, the, the, the mental health department really dedicated time to help us train ourselves in the approach that we needed to implement uh, in order to provide the services that the family impacted by, by a tra tra tragedy and also trauma. And we built a relationship with community after 9-11 that were very, very closely. And I was one of the speaker to talk to them about what was needed in the community and the work that we needed to do. Okay, next. Oh, here I am uh, with my husband, Moise Pere, as I said before, uh, he, we met in junior high school 51. He also graduated from John Jay High School. We went to Brooklyn College and then we were part of that group that started Alianza Dominicana. And here we have Lucinia and her aunt who connected, helped her connect with me. And she, is, she was at the time the, the mental health uh, leader, uh, mental health, um, um, she was the, the person in charge of the mental health clinic. She's a clinician and we are all connected. We are happy to meet again and for me to be telling the story or the work that we did, at, at not only for 9-11 because she came 10 years before 9-11 to the agency, right after graduating Columbia um, School of Social Work, she did her internship with her and she stayed at Alianza for 15 years. And here we are in my house sharing the, the document and all the objects that is going to be collected in the museum, part of the 9-11. And I am so happy to be telling the story of the work that is and was was so important and is today and it is for the future of any community that go through what we went through with 9-11. Thank you for having me. I'm ready for to continue. Thank you so much. I'm very emotional with um, all the pictures. They were like so beautiful and, and seeing like all the work that you have done like to educate yourself and prepare yourself to this work because this is not only emotional labor most of us 
uh, that are in the field, like take care of like how we're going to interact with the communities. As you also like Manny as well went like in a specific route in the school that was able to like guide him in how to work as well, Milagro. And now I'm very excited to introduce uh, Luz Daddy Hirando, who has been a extremely supportive uh, collaborator uh, from NICOSH. She was prior uh, working with another nonprofit organization during the attacks and uh, identifying Latinos that needed to uh, understand better how to communicate or how to understand how to get the funding from the Walter Center program that NICOSH had as well to understand what's happening. There were a lot of language barriers during that time uh, and communication was key. Uh, our beloved Luz Daddy, uh, she was a safety and health specialist as well, as I said, at NICOSH. She trained thousands of immigrant workers and advocates for their rights in the workplace. She also served as a bridge between NICOSH, immigrant workers, and community-based organizations accomplishing the goal of unity among workers to improve the workplace condition. She was a research assistant in um, Harvard University at Cambridge, as well as a research assistant at Cornell Medical Center. Um, and it was working as a field researcher for the financial diaries of the Center for Financial Services Innovation in New York City. Uh, sin más preámbulo, I want to introduce Ms. Luz Dari. Thank you, thank you so much, Lucina. But beforehand, I would really like to express my most sincere gratitude to the National Museum of American History in Nissonian because you are making us part of history. Of history meaning that our great 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 grandchildren one day will go and see oh this is what happened so thank you thank you so much for making us a part of it my name is Luzari Giraldo uh, I was born in Bogota Colombia in a very very popular barrio very popular of our siblings of eight my father immigrated to the USA and back in 1970s and he started working in a restaurant as a dishwasher and one by one one by one he was able to bring us here now I arrived here as a teenage I started working in restaurants with my papa and then in hotels as housekeeping doing cleaning uh, selling uh, ollas doing all this type of work and finally I was working as a day laborer I was one of the first um, day laborer kid or teenage who would stamp in a 79th street in Queens waiting for her to be uh, pick up to do some uh, day labor some construction um, but I, I wanted to study so I continued studying I went to La Guardia then to Hunter I did my my um, scholarships at, at, at Harvard but then I got married and then I had three children and I, what my all this daughter was born with heart conditions. So unfortunately I had to leave my whole dream and uh, take care of her and then I was happily divorced. So I was struggle, struggling and struggling. And on September 11, I was heading to 919 play, Park Place. I was getting a license for one of the restaurants. So I was holding three part-time jobs, was at the uh, Arthritis Foundation, then uh, Fresh Air Fund, where children could go for free for summer camp, and I was getting licenses for liquor stores and, and restaurants and, and so and so. So when I was there, I, that was on the day that happened. Then a week after, I received a call from a very friend of mine, Marta Garcia, a psychotherapist, and she said, listen, I'm working at this organization. I want you to come. We have a program about uh, to provide emotional support to families of 9-11, to families who lost a loved one. So I said, I definitely say yes. But you know, I was remembering what Milagro said. It's just, yes, I got a, a, a psychology and here and there title, but it was, it, that was individual and that was that organizing pyramid anyway. So I started working at this organization um, with families who would come and um, we received so many uh, fundings to provide services and to buy, provide cash assistance. But then I had so many people coming and people saying, listen, workers saying we're being forced to work around the World Trade Center with extremely, extremely hardest conditions. Some of them were coughing, they had uh, um, uh, bronchitis and asthma and all of the things that they never had. And um, so I started uh, 
in addition to the work, emotional support that I was supposed to do at this organization, Paul said, well, you know, I, I really like to, to help on, on, on work decisions, on safety and health. And then I started doing this, but um, the organization that I was at the moment, I did not fit their goal. The goal was not to safety and help the workers. It was just to provide services or information to the families impacted by 9-11. So I was let go. And then I said, okay, I have a, no job. But then like Latin American Integration Center, uh, at the moment, it was very small. It was just beginning to submerge. They called me and they said, we have a project where with Dr. Stephen Marku Markowitz, uh, an occupational doctor who was, he had a project with like about, uh, it was a mobile bank campaign, but we, he would go to um, a places uh, in um, Roosevelt Avenue uh, doing work with day laborers. So day laborers would come, they would have an occupation, yes, these different types of exams. And then at the same time, I will be doing like reaching out to them, letting them, them, letting them know the rights and everything. But then I realized that hundreds, hundreds of those day laborers were, working at the ground zero and they had so many illnesses and conditions and then uh, that that's when the whole thing said wow even these few years have passed and then we there's still some workers who and my job was to provide them with information about the workers rights that's it not occupational it is not but um i continue doing that and then one day Carmen Calderon, who now works at the Department of Labor, but back then used to work at the at NICOSH, New York Committee for Occupational Safety and Health, where I work right now. She called me and she said, listen, Ustari, we have an opening at NICOSH for a project coordinator for 9-11. I said, great. So I right away accepted. I moved from like now it's actually Latin American Integration Center is what is known now by Make the Road New York. It was back before Make the Road by walking in like and then came together and then they created made their own New York. Uh, but I moved to NICOSH before that. When I got to NICOSH, it was in 2006, I started doing this and then I realized how many Latino immigrant 9-11 workers, they didn't know about the services, nothing. They had no idea. So I started um, calling unions, occupational doctors, lawyers, nonprofits, worker centers, coming together to provide a comprehensive uh, type of services for them. Right here in the pictures, what we're seeing is that we, there were um, work excellence that was Center of Excellence for 9-11 survivors. They had at Bellevue, Montefiore, and uh, Mount Sinai, who they, they were providing a monitoring and medical assistance to nanny levers. However, I remember when I worked back with Latin American Integration Center, I said, but many hundreds of workers live in Queens. How come we don't have a clinic here? We were able to bring uh, occupational doctors and lawyers to hold these huge events. The one that you're seeing in the picture is at uh, Bellevue, uh, Dr. Jorge Jimenez, great, great, occupational doctor he opened the doors and then a lot of workers would come and we'll let them know about uh, the their, their program about medical monitoring um and then um we had another right here it was also at monsey night in montefiore um no gouverneur i'm sorry gouverneur hospital but they didn't have one in quiz so we started fighting for uh 9-11 Latino workers to have a World Trade Center, Center of Excellence Clinic that they could go to in Queens. So I remember Equatorian International Center, Marta Zambrano helped us so much on, on this. And eventually there was a World Trade Center Health Clinic open in Queens. So, but then, but then they didn't have the uh, a compensation fund. They just have the World Trade Center monitoring, but they were not being compensated. They have the right to be compensated because they were victims of crime. So we came together again with unions, with worker centers, with uh, occupational doctors, lawyers, organizations, um, politicians, everyone who helped us to create a fund so that these workers who say, yes, I'm here. And this is the thing, we were working a lot, a lot with undocumented workers who unfortunately did not have any other um, resources. Um, so we, right here in the picture, it was Carmen Calderon. She's the one who brought me to NICOSH, then Suherami NICOSH. And she now works for the Department of Labor but back then. And we reached out to every single uh, Latino newspaper. We reached out to every single organization and they started going around and then in, in, in distributing information about the, the, the fact that now, back then, um, 
it was actually James Adroga Bill. It was a police officer who died trying to show that his illness was related to 9-11. After he died, the James Adroga Bill was enacted. And therefore, after that, all the 9-11 um, workers were, were eligible. They stopped at a point right here. There were so many workers here they were um, who volunteer and work. And they were trying and struggling to show that their illnesses and the sickness and their cancer related and everything was related to 9-11. They had to struggle a lot. And we, again, with newspapers and, and with all these, um, we serve as a bridge between the resources that we're receiving and, and, the, and their needs. So we brought together so many organizations. So we created this fund and we helped, we helped directly uh, all the Latino workers, especially the undocumented, to, to apply for this fund. And that's one of the, um, right there, one of the first papers, we would do it through through media. We use Latino media to get to those unreachable, to use to those hard to find works again. And we needed to do this because there were many undocumented workers who unfortunately, because at the beginning they did not have any resources and information and they got sick and they had no choice but to move to other states or to go back to their country. We at NICOSH followed some workers, even in Colombia. They went back to Colombia and they, some of them died, unfortunately, Ecuador, um, Argentina, uh, Mexico. We had so many workers going back to their country. And we just, our work was not here, as you can see right here, not uh, educating workers in New York, but overseas, letting them know that if they had proved that they had work around the first year, around Ground Zero, that they could benefit from the work, from the Crime Victims Compensation Fund, who luckily, and thank goodness, after so many fights amongst unions and organizations and everything, it's been extended until 20, uh, 2090. And also there were the, the um, medical monitoring. So, but it was not easy. It was really, really a hard work to do, but it was not NICOSH. It was a coalition of all the organizations who, who had been providing different types of, uh, of, of resources. Next. Um, okay, and so again, we reached out to so many local newspapers because those are the ones really that we could find for the hard to reach, like um, other newspapers, they would not. So the hard to reach population would reach out to all these newspapers and we were able to find hundreds and hundreds of workers. We were working with 2000 undocumented Latino workers and um, because of these newspapers. So we got so many, so many, and we were not only fighting to get them medical monitoring, which they are, not only to get them uh, workers' compensation, which they are getting, uh, and crime victims' compensation, but we were really fighting uh, to get them uh, a U visa. So back in 9-11, when the families who were undocumented died on that day, 3,000 I don't that date more, but let's say 3,000 people died on that day, undocumented families were able to get a U visa. And then we started the fight saying, why not get a U visa for undocumented workers who say, yes, here I am, who gave their life and their health, and they deserve a U visa. But, well, it, it didn't happen, uh, but a lot of uh, community um, newspapers help us a lot on this fight. Next. And so we created again. This is this is not a done deal. Uh, we fought so much um, in order to make possible for undocumented Latino workers to be eligible for workers' compensation and for the crime victims fund, uh, which now they are. But it was not easy. It was a fight, and again, it was not a fight of NICOSH. It was a fight of unions, of workers' centers, of politicians. Uh, we. We have right here the health care and benefits. In order for us to create this booklet, it was really difficult. But to create this booklet, it was at the beginning. It was the World Trade Center register. We had about 400,000 people who were enrolled, somehow, somehow uh, exposed to the 9-11 dust. And in order for us to create this health care and benefits, in English, it was a, it was really a lot of work, a lot of work. But to translate it into Spanish, it was even more. But right here, the, that was the 
first 9-11 healthcare and benefits, where we would provide so much information about resources and everything. The World Trade Center Programa de Atención Médica Manual para Miembros. This is history for me, and this is very touching because, again, many 9-11 Latino workers who went back to their countries, if right here, doctors could not identify that a cancer, for example, in the mouth was not related to 9-11, or certain cancers were not related to 9-11. In other countries, it was even difficult. And so what we did is fought for a document like this, this Amanua, to be in Spanish, and then this manual to be sent to Colombia, to Mexico, to Ecuador. So the 9-11 undocumented Latino workers who had no choice to go back, take this document or this manual, to their doctor and say, listen, this is what I did, and this is the what I have, the condition I have, please provide me with a proper treatment. So this is very important and help us really, not uh, in New York, but national, there are national clinics, but also overseas to uh, kind of educate the, the doctors about the um, the illnesses and conditions that uh, a lot of these Danny level workers were presenting. Next. And this is it. <laughs> Thank you so much, Rosari. I, I think like this is key. Uh, Nikosh as well, the, this amazing um, um, campaign uh, citywide with uh, a Spanish hat that has the picture of Yvonne Sanchez that we also like collected. Thanks to you for bringing this up and as well like telling us about this app. This this was one of the first uh, citywide campaigns by Nikosh. There was all over MTA bosses. We have it uh, in Queens, in Brooklyn, in the Bronx, uh, New Jersey. So it was very special to have like a friend that says like if you were there. Si estuviste ahí, por favor, llámanos. If you were there, please call us. And I think this is a perfect uh, way to transition now to Yolanda, because Yolanda was working with a lot of these uh, particular workers and families that were uh, losing um, a loved one in the attacks but didn't know how to communicate with them, didn't know how to speak English, and the Mexican consulate was there for them. And I'm very happy to introduce uh, Yolanda Castro now. Uh, she did her bachelor and her master in a very, very own Bronx Fordham University. Yes, uh, she did her master in um, international politics. She worked in the uh, Misión Mexicana with the ONU uh, and uh, have been working for four years in the Mexican Foreign Services, assigned as well as I mentioned to the UN mission uh, and as the press officer uh, assigned to the Mexican Consulate General in New York City, where she remained 12 years currently as an interpreter of Spanish and English in courts that are very important as well for our communities and interpreted. And in the community as well, a uh, study uh, in different uh, places that uh, were deep giving a different approach to work with community in international spheres. And now I want to give the word to our wonderful Yolanda Castro. Thank you, Justina. Thank you to all. Uh, I'm very um, proud to be here today. Uh, I'm very honored to share this um, panel with these panelists that are so uh, important and valuable for our communities uh, uh, in the during and after the 9-11 attacks, especially uh, reflecting on how it affected ourselves personally and how it affected our communities. I work for a long time for the Mexican community in New York, as it was just mentioned before I work in the West Coast with mi migrant workers. So it was uh, uh, all my life, I, I was involved with uh, with this uh, population. Uh, in in the 20 years ago, uh, the Mexican population was starting to settle and consolidate in New York. Actually, their migration started uh, coming from the um, they were coming. The map that is being shown is where they coming the main um, immigrants that 
began coming in the 80s and consolidated in the 90s, were coming from the Mixteca region in, of Puebla, Oaxaca, and Guerrero, as is shown in the map. Uh, they were uh, communities that were indigenous. Many of the newcomers spoke uh, their original languages, like uh, Zapoteco, Mixteco, uh, Clapaneco, and others. And um, they were uh, coming because of work. Uh, and this is the the, the reason they were drawn so far away. Um, and the thing is that after, well, the census of 2000, it counted around 190,000 Mexicans, we believe, because they don't get counted uh, very ex accurate. There's more, most likely close to 300,000. Uh, next pictures, please. So when they arrived, they took over works that were overlooked by others uh, for long hours, low pace. We saw them. Uh, Everywhere we start beginning and seeing in restaurants, delis, uh, dishwashing, cooking, delivering food around the clock, uh, cleaning offices in the delis, selling flowers in the construction, you name it. Next picture, please. They also, uh, many of them, this shows uh, a photograph of Windows of the World. Um, that was the restaurant located on the World Trade Center because many workers work in the downtown Manhattan in the area where World Trade Center was, and some of them did at this restaurant located on one of the towers, 107th floor of uh, North Tower, and that came down with most of the morning crew of the, of the restaurant that were mostly composed of immigrants, among them our Mexican immigrants. Well, after the attacks, the worst uh, part uh, um, was trying to, to make sense of what happened and also trying urgently to find people that were missing can I have next picture, please? Uh, this is a leaflet uh, banishing one of the poles in, in the city of the many we saw. There were so many people in New York missing. Just like the consulate of Mexico, it became uh, an, a terrible, awful and difficult task to carry out with so little information as we had. We were dealing with an undocumented community that lived very underground, that were afraid of coming forward, uh, distrust, all kinds of authorities because of their status. To locate a missing uh, immigrant, uh, we had to set, establish that they lived in New York and they were at the site at the time of the attacks. Some immigrant workers had used fake IDs or work under assumed names. The employers didn't really care or mind as far as they did the work. They got paid in cash, so there was no trail, paper trail or any sort to verify this. And after the attacks, many of these employers refused to help in identifying the former employees. Many immigrants shared uh, crowded apartments and, and, and rooms and basement to make ends meet. And so they might know each other or not, and they don't have anything under their name, no, no um, bills, leases. So. Can I have next picture, please? Uh, so it was left for the families back home. This picture shows uh, an offering of the day of the death on 2001, where uh, names of some of the disappeared are posted uh, along with a picture uh, in Mexico. The families in these remote areas were left with the task of trying to prove that their loved ones had been there during the attacks. Some don't have, didn't have much, only have to rely on confirmation of employers or DNA testing. And we know this didn't go uh, too far because there were many remains that were never recovered. In the case of Mexico, we only uh, know of a single bone of one of the Mexican victims that was recovered and sent back to their family. Um, the families only knew their loved ones had left that morning and vanished after the towers collapse. Can I have next picture, please? This shows a fountain, um, uh, the 9-11 memorial with one of the names of one of the Mexicans with a flag. The consulate work um, uh, without a stop with attorneys, with agencies, city agencies, the families of the victims, people that might know them. A source of great support, as already Manny Castro mentioned it in his presentation, was uh, for Mexican immigrants and for us, as the authorities that were trying to locate them were the Mexican organizations working already in the community, like Casa Mexico, Casa Puebla, and also Asociación Tepeyac, that was very instrumental in, in, in 
in trying to locate. They work so much with the community. They were so invested, as you saw it in the previous uh, presentation, the first presentation we, we saw. Um, and the consulate put together a list of uh, 16 Mexican uh, victims at World Trade Center attack, but only five of these names made it into the official records and are being acknowledged and inscribed in the in the memorial, mainly for the lack of evidence. And in the absence of remains, it, they continue to be missing and a pending task. Uh, the consulate uh, supported as much as they could. Can I have the next slide, please? This is another view of the of the memorial with the skyline on the back. Uh, the families, any way possible, with logistics, financially, and all those that wanted to come legally to put up their cases together and continuously working to look for the lost ones, even in the months and years that came. Uh, through the Mexican Cultural Institute of New York, the uh, consulate set up a compensation fund to gather money, uh, raise money for the families in our list that we believe lost loved ones during the attack. And later in 2006, still working these cases and many other situations with the Mexican uh, population, the consular received a call from New York Police Department that they had a discovery. Uh, they, among the, the ruins of World Trade Center, they had found a torn and faded Mexican flag and they wanted to bring it back to us. It seemed, uh, next picture please, it shows here a hall of flags in one of the towers of the World Trade Center. It seemed to be one of those flags that hang in this area of the World Trade Center. And the flag was delivered to us in a, very, in a private but very emotional uh, act, very respectfully. Can I have the next picture? And there it was. There it is, the Mexican flag found at World Trade Center. As you can see, it had visible uh, signs of the destruction it survived. The red especially is torn and full of holes. Uh, the, um, the rest of the flag is better preserved. Some You can see some lines like vertical lines uh, crossing the flag, especially in the white area. Uh, they might be done, have been probably done by the flagpole that once held it up. Um, so perhaps one of the most powerful symbols uh, that was there remaining intact looking at us was the eagle on the cactus, the, mil, uh, the national emblem of Mexico. Perhaps is one of the most powerful symbols of our Mexicanidad, our Mexican identity. Uh, this is the same sign given to uh, ancient Mexicans to find uh, where they located a, a, an eagle perch and a cactus. They had to found the new city and that's when the city of Tenochtitlan become um, and it's also the the sign of the Mexican identity uh, uh, it, it's possible our ancestors were telling us that um, of the endurance and the strength of our people by raising this flag from the rubble and it was like I thought to myself all these people we lost left something behind after all to be able to find and be recovered. Um, next picture, please. Uh, the The flag was uh, uh, st stayed in New York and it was uh, publicly put in an area where everybody could see in the fifth anniversary of the attacks with this commemorating plaque that says to all in memory of all the Mexicans and all those that lost their lives in the terrorist attacks on September 11 of 2001 in New York. Probably a uh, final thought I, I, I want to share with you when I was putting together this was so emotional. After the events of 9-11, something that uh, lesson we, we had to learn from there and other tragedies is how for the Mexican and other similar communities, uh, the extreme degree of vulnerability represents to be undocumented workers here. It is uh, painful to watch every day can I have the next picture? But in the face of tragedy, they become as invisible in death as they were in lives. And that's also another tragedy. Uh, this picture shows one of our own song heroes, Rafael Hernandez. He used to be a former um, 
firefighter in Mexico. He was working undocumented in New York like for two years before the attacks. And he was in the area and instead of running away, he ran towards the danger, kicking his instincts kicking in to save people. And he was able to, uh, they, he was given some gear and was able to help people out, including a, a pregnant woman, um, very of uh, nine months pregnant to go down 28 floors and he is not enough being recognized. And well, I think this has to change because these immigrants make this country strong and they help also the other, uh, our other uh, countries with their remittances and their hard work. And they have to stop being invisible to us all. Well, thank you. That's what I have to share with you today. Thank you so much, Yolanda. And uh, I wanted to give like this moment as well to like let um, everybody know in the chat that or in the audience that we're going to like be uh, joining the Q and A. Everybody, but if you have questions, uh, you can like drop it in the chat, and we're going to try to to answer it as much as possible. I see that for Alex Carney, uh, um, Manny was responding that yes, definitely potential volunteers to NICE can email info at nice.org and you can get involved. Uh, they have different uh, spaces and one that's uh, special that is in Queens and Jackson High, very close to Elmore's hospital. Um, I wanted to continue and open the space to everybody. Um, and the first question that I wanted to drop, um, I think is for Manny as well, for Manny and Yolanda. Um, how can we see the changes in between uh, contemporary Latinx activism? and 9-11, how was this change and how do you see that the community started to organize themselves and get involved in political life? Can you, you want to take it, Manny? Uh, yeah, I can start. Thank you, Jolanda. I, um, I think certainly the, the, the worker centers and the nonprofit organizations, um, you know, uh, it's tough in New York City. Um, uh, it's an expensive city to sustain uh, efforts, uh, you know. But we've had, you know, some successes and some organizations that are not around anymore. Uh, but we've definitely matured. Uh, I think there's there's um, there's a lot of uh, I think local community organizing happening, and you, I mean, you saw it. Uh, during COVID, a lot of mutual aid organizations or groups uh, came together to support the immigrant community or to support each other amongst each other. Uh, but certainly there's there's a lot uh, to still do. Um, it's, it, it's quite challenging because New York, uh, as I said, it's, it's expensive to sustain an organization. Um, we're always in constant threat of, you know, getting gentrified out of our neighborhoods, um, and so, you know, it's uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, civic engagement, but I, I would say with the lack of uh, immigration reform, there are a lot of undocumented immigrants that have not been able to gain gain status and so they still can't vote even if they've lived here 30 plus years and that certainly limits limits you know the, the way that they can engage uh, civically um and maybe uh yolanda if you want to extend a little bit what money uh just said or milagros because i know that all of you have worked on that well, very briefly, uh, I will say that I've seen people grow to become more uh, aware and less fearful of defending their rights. They're still in a very vulnerable place. Many of them are. As many mentioned, this is a very expensive city. There is not a, a network that will support them. They don't have, uh, on the face of, of well, 9-11, a lot of workers had to leave. United States because they, they there was an exodus in reverse. There was no jobs. They couldn't, you know, 
sustain themselves and 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 in COVID, it, it's the same thing. They are uh, completely, uh, they were the first responders in a way because they did, couldn't stop working. And, and, and so, but I see them more resolved. There is this new organization of deliveristas, the way they call mm -hmm. themselves, delivery workers that are putting themselves, defending their rights after the pandemic. They work so, the pandemic, they work so hard and they, and, and they are now finding ways to organize, even if they are without documents, if they don't have a recognition from either government, they are making them, their voices heard. And that's very, uh, very uh, inspiring in a lot of ways. Uh, if like uh, Lizetti and Milagro want, I can like do another question. I uh, continue on this one, and it's about the, expan the expansion of the labor that you all are doing. I know that NICO is not only an organization that create uh, an effect only in the Latino community in New York City, but it's a uh, organization that has an impact like uh, nationwide and I wanted to ask you all like how do you see that the efforts that a lot of like Latino communities have done in New York City has expanded in different cities I know that many have been traveling with the nice team for different um, cities on um, uh, creating awareness of a lot of like uh, discrepancies that are um, in this uh, past administration and that uh, we needed to like create conscious that we needed to continue uh, fighting and continue uh, educating our communities in our language and uh, for our rights. So do you want to talk a little bit like uh, that Luz Daddy or Manny or any of you, how the impact of New York City community organization has creating another effect nationwide. I can, if I made um, one of my worries right now, it's because a lot of, there were about 75,000 people registered, 9-11 workers registered for medical monitoring. And uh, there are other, you know, everywhere in the United States. So one of the things we're doing is reaching out to the occupational clinics in each state so that they can receive information about one COVID. My biggest worry is because a lot of them had been without any medical monitoring or any control for one year and a half because of COVID. And so now we're gonna start seeing the consequences about the 9-11 Latino workers not receiving any medical. However, the one of the things that I'm so happy to see, I remember that I told you about the World Trade Center excellence of uh, clinics that back in 2000, after 9-11, last, uh, uh, County to open a one was in Queens, but contrary to that, in COVID, the first that was Elmhurst Hospital. The Elmhurst Hospital was the first to open the COVID excellence of uh, for COVID survivors. Um, mm -hmm. Also, we were able to create with Nice and so many organizations here a excluded workers fund, so that undocumented workers would be eligible for these excluded workers funds and we're trying to bring it to other states as well so that other workers in other states could, could also benefit from it and also workers compensation my 9-11 our 9-11 undocumented workers and workers in general had to struggle to get workers compensation after 9-11 but now everyone will tell you them if you had COVID, you have to register for workers compensation and we're helping them not here but state wise so that's a lessons learned from 9 11 we're doing it we're doing it house but we also have like national coach is a national so we are bringing this information to other states so that's uh my part i don't know if money i would like to add to what i feel that now is very different from the way that we did organizing back in the 80, in the 90, specifically in the Dominican communities. In terms of civil uh, commitment or developing non-for-profits, that has not been possible. But yes, I see a group of the new young men and women in the community that they are either organizing or putting uh, organization for profit. Services are now for profit. 
a lot of organizing politically, uh, running for uh, elector official. That's the movement that I see uh, in the last uh, 10, 15 years. But in terms of committing to the non-for-profits, uh, that this is not a money-making business, I don't see much of that happening. And in terms of the work that needed to, that we did in New York City, that really, really, uh, we had a support, not only from city and state and federal agency, but private funding, that is not happening as much as used to happen when we first had that, I would say, uh, the fever to, uh, to be in the community providing services. So I think poly uh, uh, younger people are really looking at the for-profit and also the political position, being elected official. Um, I wanted to like comment a little bit on about uh, the, a few points that Luz Daddy as well as Yolanda did uh, on the bills that have passed that have contributed uh, to all Americans, not only Latinos and the Latino community have been a big push, uh, especially for the Sadroga ad in the very beginning with the World Trade Center program, with the World Trade Center uh, funds. And the last one that we have, that now we have 70 more years of funding for, uh, with the Luis Alvarez bill. And I, I really wanted to, I, I know that we have only three minutes, but I just like wanted uh, to hear from any of you, how do you feel with this particular news that um, is bringing not only security in terms of like uh, healthcare access to so many of uh, Latinos and immigrants that were not necessarily able to like get uh, the funding and get the care uh, to continue treating their cancer related debris uh, um, and other ones that have like extra complications with uh, the current pandemic. How do you feel about this particular bill to pass? I don't, I just feel extremely happy. <laughs> those faceless, those who were not counted, now they are not faceless. Now they have the right for in a long, long time to receive medical monitoring and treatment. That is a human right. That is the right of those of 9-11 um, undocumented and documented Latino workers. So I'm just extremely happy. Thank you. Uh, I do want to jump in and, and say it's it's just it's a great acknowledgement of of what the, the community has gone through, has suffered in in the contributions. Uh, and since we're almost almost out of time, I, I want to say that it's so critical to have to achieve immigration reform, you know, uh, soon. I know there's a proposal that would include essential workers as part of, of a package of bills uh, coming up, but it's so, so important that we get that done as soon as possible. I mean, like I said, many uh, workers who experienced 9-11 firsthand continue to be undocumented 20 years on, and uh, and many have been undocumented, you, you know, uh, over 30 years since the last immigration reform bill in 1986. So it's so important, um, you know, whenever I talk about 9-11, I remind folks that, you know, immigrants have only continued to contribute after Hurricane Sandy about a decade ago. They were, they were you know, second responders helping to clean uh, and recover, uh, help families recover here in New York City, uh, most recently with COVID and, you know, they can continue they continue to contribute and so we need immigration reform we need to get people the statuses that they deserve uh because then they'll be able to work uh you know out of the shadows and benefit from health insurance and other benefits that they deserve Thank you so much, Manny, for this last reflection. And I would love to uh, thank 
each one of you for giving this amazing presence for all the work that you have been doing with the communities and i know that you are inspiring a whole new generation of like latinx uh community workers artists politicians that want to get uh involved and want to push the community for greatness i am very happy to as well be working in a space that is committed to expand the narrative of the american experience including uh, contributions to this amazing uh, country and how we're going to like continue unpacking this the complexity of being American. I want to close now and say thank you to the Mexican Cultural Institute, to Beatriz Nava, to Ixnit Irruegas, uh, to Miguel Gleason and the Mexican uh, Consulate General. Uh, thank you so much to Leanne and Luz Daddy from NICOSH. And I hope you all enjoy this. We have the September 11, 2001, and evolving legacy in our webpage, and as well uh, as stories of a change world that is a story gathering tool. It's available, uh, available in Spanish, it's disponible in Espanol, and it's a story gathering tool that welcomes everybody to give your experience and to tell us how it was for you uh, this particular moment in history, September 11, 2001. Gracias a todos y tengan buenas noches.